kindly introduce uh, him. In fact, I'm very honored to introduce uh, Professor Nambudiri. He's a full, currently he's a full professor in IIT Mumbai, and he's a, actually a frequent uh, resource person to many of our programs <coughs> in association with the SRIPS. He's a native of Kerala. He did his master's from Mangalore University, and his PhD is from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, with Professor S. N. Uh, Bal Subramanian. He did a couple of postdocs. The first one in Israel with uh, Professor Alfred Hasner in University of uh, Bar Ilan, and then he moved to the United States and uh, worked with Professor Alan Merchant at University of uh, North Texas. He then from there he moved to Columbia University and worked with Professor Ronald Breslow. And then he spent a short you know, period uh, in an industry named the Sam Savinsa Corporation. And then he joined IIT Mumbai. His research interests are in organic synthesis, methodology, mechanism, and asymmetric synthesis. He has produced more than 20 PhDs, more than 160 publications, six patents, two book chapters, and he has written a book which is quite famous on name reactions uh, with Professor Alfred Hasner. I think that is the, the, the named reaction book uh, dealing with maximum number of uh, named reaction, if I am not mistaken. Uh, <laughs> more than science fiction. Yeah, I, I have never seen any book uh, having that many or even half, half of that. And he has got many awards, including the CRSI bronze medal. He's visiting Professor to many universities. With this short introduction, I invite Professor Nambudri for this uh, webinar. Thank you, sir. So thank you, uh, Professor Anil Kumar, for your kind introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Arunan and Dr. Sunil Kumar for the invite, give a talk on um, Structural Determination of Organic Molecules by NMR. And uh, I believe majority of the students are MSc students. Or also PhD. Yes. Uh, the, the, yeah. There are some PhD students and some yeah. MSc students. Okay, staff members. Some teachers also. Yeah, but primarily yeah. it is meant for you know, uh, MSc yeah. level yeah. students. So I have yeah. chosen yeah. the basics of uh, you know, uh, Structural Determination of uh, Organic Molecules. And before getting into a few examples, let me uh, 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 discuss. I'm sure it Hello. So, Nabudri. I think the, uh, it's not audible. No. Hello? Can you, can you hear me, sir? Can you, can you call him and say? I don't have his number. Protons. In other words, protons with three different uh, Professional uh, Am I audible? Uh, you are audible now, but your presentation slide is not this. It's not there. Oh, slide is not being shared. Something happened in between. I have shared. I'll share once again. After Absolutely correct. Now it is visible? Yes, visible. Is the slide visible now? Yes, 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 sir. Okay. Yeah, maybe all the participants uh, can mute so that, you know, uh, there won't be any background noise. Okay, uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, let me start with the chemical shift. Um, the term was first introduced by Packard in the early 1950s uh, because 
three different uh, chemical shifts were observed for a simple organic molecule such as ethanol. And it was inferred that so uh, those three Professor uh, Namburi, I think, uh, hello? 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 Hello, sir. Uh, it's not audible. Can you hear me, sir? Hello? He has left, actually. Uh, I think there is some network issue. Yeah, yes. Uh, let me call him. Did you get his number?
അല്ല സുനിൽ സുനിൽ ആ നമ്പർ തന്നെ പ്രൊഫസർ നമ്പൂരിയുടെ നമ്പർ തന്നെ എനിക്ക് എസ് എം എസ് ചെയ്യാവോ പുള്ളി അത് ഡിസ്കണക്റ്റ് ആയി പോകുന്നു അവിടെ നെറ്റ്വർക്ക് ഇഷ്യൂ ആണെന്ന് തോന്നുന്നു ഹലോ കേൾക്കുന്നുണ്ടോ ഹലോ ഡോക്ടർ അരുണൻ Excuse me, there is some uh, you know, connectivity issues. I contacted Professor Nambudiri. He didn't know that it is disconnected. So he is actually continuing. So I, I informed, informed him. He said he will uh, try to fix it. Some uh, network issue there? I told mean, yeah, him. Uh, he didn't know about this and he has been actually lecturing. And I told him that he, uh, you know, when he started uh, on the ethanol Yeah, slide, you know, it went off. So he said he will try to fix it. Yeah, I don't see him right now because the solution yeah. is the... He's well, right now he's in his office, right? Eh? Yeah, yes. Because I, I, I called him his office phone number. Okay. So the network issue may not be there. Yeah, he has come uh, in a different door. Two ideas. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh, yeah, it's coming, sir. But it's not audible. Uh, can you unmute that? Yeah. Yes, yes. Sir. Yeah, yes. yes. No. I think there is some fluctuation in the... Uh, internet connection It never used to be there uh, but anyway okay so let me go back i think i started with uh, this slide was fixable right yeah, after yeah, that from, yeah, from yeah. the sun was disconnected okay um so the reference uh, used in um uh, say maybe uh, i don't know whether you were i was audible um the absolute 
reporting absolute uh, frequency is difficult because it takes a lot of storage space. Therefore, a reference is used, um, uh, such as uh, TMS for proton and C13, CFCl3 for F19, phosphoric acid for P31, water for O17, ammonia and nitromethane for N15, uh, and so on. Um, so one needs to report only the difference between the uh, sample frequency and the reference frequency. And TMS is used for proton and C13 because uh, it is inert, low boiling, and uh, it is soluble in common solvents. It gives a sharp signal. And also it doesn't interfere with uh, the sample signal. Now, a chemical shift uh, by definition is a function of the nucleus and its environment. And it's a molecular quantity measured from reference. We are measuring a shift. So uh, it is nuclear, nuclear shield over applied field. And you take, uh, you know, you subtract the frequency of the reference from the frequency of the sample. Um, and divide that by the applied field, then that would be a small number. So you multiply it with uh, a million, 10 to the power of six. So chemical shift is therefore a, a dimensionless because it's a ratio. And it, in other words, it's a proportionality constant. Now it increases downfield in the downfield direction from the reference. So if uh, TMS uh, frequency or the chemical shift is taken as zero and it increases the downfield direction that is from right to left and on a 60 megahertz instrument one ppm or one delta is 60 hertz a 500 megahertz instrument one ppm would be 500 hertz and so on okay now why different chemical shift range ranges for different uh, nuclei for proton uh, it's about 1 to 10 or 1 to 15 uh, normally. Um, that's because uh, proton only has s orbital and the hydrogen has a single electron that is revolving around the nucleus in a spherically symmetrical s orbital. And uh, the induced uh, magnetic field generated by that electron is opposing the applied field. Uh, in other words, a diamagnetic upfield shift is experienced by the nucleus. So the field experienced by the nucleus, Bn, is less than the uh, applied field B0. So Bn is B0 minus delta B. So delta B is the nuclear shielding. On the other hand, um, in the case of other nuclei, there are electrons in P, D, and F orbitals. Therefore, and there is no spherical symmetry. Therefore, the induced field generated by the nucleus is in the same direction of the applied field, as you can see here. Uh, so the nucleus experiences a paramagnetic downfield shift. In other words, the field experienced by the nucleus, Bn, is more than the applied field. So Bn is B0, that is applied field, plus delta B, that is a nuclear uh, de-shielding here. Uh, so B0 is the applied field, Bn is a field experienced by the nucleus, and delta B is a nuclear shielding. So you see a wide range of you know, chemical shift for different nuclei. Proton, normally it is 10 to 15, and it could go up to 30 also in some cases. Carbon-13, normally it's around 200 to 250, but it could go up to 400. Similarly, F19, the chemical shift range can be up to 1,000 and so on. Uh, now, what are the factors? Before we discuss a few examples, we, uh, it's good to know what are the factors that affect chemical shift and also coupling uh, constant. Now, you can see here that uh, in the case of um, methane, um, the chemical shift is 0 0.8. But the moment you have a slightly electronegative atom attached to carbon, iodine, uh, the chemical shift increases to 2.16. As the electronegativity of the atom changes, uh, increases, then with the 
bromomethane, it is 2.68. Chloromethane, 3.05. Fluoromethane, 4.26. So you can see wide range of uh, chemical shifts for proton attached to carbon from 0 0.8 to 4.26. In this case itself, halomethanes. Well with the uh, electronegativity of the uh, halogen attached. So proton, iodine, bromine, chlorine, flu and fluorine. Uh, similarly, uh, even a single electron can dramatically change the, uh, or a pair of electrons uh, can dramatically change the chemical shift. So chemical shift, uh, as we have seen, uh, depends on the, uh, the environment experienced by the nucleus. So that environment can be influenced by the uh, different atoms uh, and electrons and so on. So the chemical shift for benzene is 7.27. It's a six pi system. Whereas for cyclopentadienyl anion, which is also a six pi system, aromatic, but uh, you know the electrons are delocalized over five uh, atoms, the chemical shift drops to 5.42. So there's a decrease in uh, by 1.7. And that is because the extra um, electron. Um, uh, on the other hand, if there is an additional positive charge, cycloheptal trienyl cation also has six pi electrons. And, uh, but the positive charge is delocalized over uh, you know, uh, the seven carbons to which seven protons are also attached. And the chemical shift increases by about 1.9 ppm, and it is 9.17. So you can see dramatic change in chemical shift depending upon the environment experienced by the nucleus, whether it is you know, proton or carbon. Now, hydrogen bonding can also affect chemical shift. And you know, hydrogen bonding uh, uh, is possible with protons attached to electronegative atoms such as oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and so on. The uh, chemical shift of phenolic proton could be anywhere between four, four and you know, eight in this range, depending upon the concentration. And you know, the um, uh, hydrogen bonding is concentration dependent, uh, especially for intermolecular hydrogen bonding. And in this case, you have an intramolecular hydrogen bonding and the OH proton comes to resonance at 12. Uh, similarly here, um, uh, ethyl aceto uh, acetate, there's a possibility uh, of, uh, you know, the keto form tautomerizing to the enol form to form this six member, uh, you know, ring. And the hydrogen bonding, uh, I mean, the chemical shift of the hydrogen bonded proton is uh, again uh, around 12. So highly de-shielded. Now, I think most of you know this, but I will quickly, uh, you know, um, uh, brush, uh, recap uh, these uh, points that acetylenic protons uh, appear uh, shielded compared to many other, you know, olefinic and aromatic protons. Uh, that is primarily because in the applied magnetic field, acetylene orients, you know, parallel to the applied magnetic field in this fashion. And the proton is in the uh, diamagnetic shielding region. So at the center, the nucleus experiences a shielding effect. Therefore, acetylenic protons come in this range, 1.5 to 3.5. Whereas olefinic protons, an alkene orients in an applied magnetic field in this fashion. And uh, the uh, at the center, again, the Induced magnetic field is opposed to the applied field, but in the periphery, it is in the same direction of the applied field. And the olefinic protons are in the periphery. In other words, the protons are in the paramagnetic um, uh, de-shielding region. Therefore, these protons appear a de-shielding effect and uh, appear in this range, four to eight, or a narrow range could be about six to uh, nine or so. And what about aromatic protons? So in addition to uh, um, the, uh, I mean, uh, compared to when compared to isolated olefins, uh, aromatic rings have the so-called, uh, you know, 
uh, ring current. They generate a ring current because of the delocalization of the pi electron cloud above and below the plane of the benzene ring. Again, that ring current is opposing the applied field at the center, uh, and it is in the same direction of the applied field in the periphery, and the protons are in the periphery in the paramagnetic deshielding zone. Therefore, aromatic protons also get deshielded to this range about 6 to 9 uh, ppm. And what about aldehyde protons? Aldehyde protons uh, also appear uh, highly deshielded. In fact, more deshielded than olefinic and aromatic protons come in this 9 to 10 region. Again, uh, you can see from this uh, diagram that uh, the protons are in the periphery of the Hello. I think again the uh, connection lost. Yeah. Let me call him. I have his mobile number. Will call or I, I have to call. Eight, six to I nine. Oh. And uh, um, uh, yeah, is there a problem? There was some problem in between the sound was lost. You missed any slides? Or? Uh, just before that, there was some, I mean, the audio was not clear. Yeah, it, it was okay. For the first part, it was okay. Maybe, I don't know whether somehow... Uh, Got muted. No, I am unmuted. It's okay, uh, yeah, but Woody was not clear. Maybe, uh, yeah, this part is complete almost. I'm almost ready. Can, I, I think you can go ahead. Well, okay. Maybe which slide was not clear? Uh, I can go, I can. No, I'll be ready. This part was your explaining, and uh, yeah. This was okay? Uh, this was okay. Aldehyde part, aldehyde, aldehyde. From aldehyde. aldehyde. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, this one was okay. I mean, at the end, there was some... Uh, In fact, I'm using problem. two computers on my desktop. I can see the slides, but... Uh, uh, the slide was there, but the audio was not clear. Audio was not clear. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, the aldehyde proton also appears in the uh, deshielding uh, con of the you know molecule, therefore... It gets, uh, it appears in the 9 to 10 uh, range. Okay, so this is a summary of the chemical shifts of uh, acetylene, uh, alkene, aromatic ring, and aldehyde. Uh, you can see a wide range of chemical shifts uh, in the 0 to 10 range for uh, various protons. Um, and if you take uh, a simple ethane, the chemical shift is even less than one. It's about 0 0.88. But that is for ethane, uh, the methyl protons of ethane. But uh, suppose the methyl uh, group is uh, attached to an sp2 center, as in this case, then the chemical shift is about 1.95. So again, it depends on the environment. It is not necessary that all the methyl protons will come at the same place. Uh, in, in toluene, in toluene, it comes around 2.34. Uh, the methyl group is, so in addition to the pi electron cloud of a simple olefin, you have the pi electron cloud of the aromatic ring that is further deshielding the methyl protons. Uh, on the other hand, in this particular case, is a very interesting case, uh, the methyl protons are highly shielded, appear at about minus 4.2. In, in fact, upfield of TMS. Uh, and that's because this is, an, is a peripheral aromatic system. And at, we have seen at the center, uh, the, uh, the, the molecule experiences um, or the nuclei experience a diamagnetic shielding effect. In the periphery, the peripheral protons would be highly deshielded. 
as you can see uh, in this case, it's a classic example, 18 anulene. It is there in all the textbooks. The peripheral protons, 12 peripheral protons appear at about 8.9, whereas the internal protons, six internal protons appear at 1.8. Such a large difference in chemical shift. Now, one can even distinguish between axial and equatorial protons, um, you know, if you freeze uh, the, uh, you know, the conformation of cyclohexane, there is a difference of about measurable difference, 0 0.5 ppm uh, difference. The equatorial proton uh, gets downshielded uh, by about 0.5 ppm. Okay, so I have given a quick, uh, overview of uh, chemical shift, which uh, all organic MS should be uh, you know, familiar with. Now let us uh, quickly move on to coupling constant. Again, I have not discussed any theory uh, you know, uh, much behind chemical shift. Similarly, uh, there is a lot of theory behind spin, spin coupling as well, but my today's uh, presentation is concerned with uh, more with interpretation rather than a theory. I am sure you have been exposed to the theory of spin-spin coupling already. So let us take a couple of examples and discuss. Um, I am sure you know this molecule, cinnamic acid. The protons alpha and beta to the carboxylic acid appear as doublets. For example, proton A appears as a doublet because we know A couples with uh, X. Uh, in other words, A sees X in two different orientations. So A comes to resonance twice. And similarly, proton X uh, sees proton A in two different orientations. So X also comes to resonance twice. That is why we see um, two doublets. And sometimes those two doublets could come closer and become an AB quartet as well, which we will discuss uh, later. Now, um, uh, and it's a one is to one doublet. The, another simple explanation is that uh, the appearance of a particular proton depends on its neighbor. So if neighbors is N, then that multiplicity will be N plus one. One neighbor means two uh, lines. That means a doublet. N, simple N plus one rule applies for spin half nuclei. Proton is a spin half nucleus. Uh, so also carbon-13, F-19, and P-31, the nuclei that are relevant to uh, organic MS. Otherwise, you need to use the general formula 2Ni plus 1, where I is a spin uh, quantum number of the nucleus and N uh, is the number of nuclei. Let us take another example. This proton A appears, even though it's a single proton, it appears as a triplet because it has two neighbors, n plus one rule again. And it appears as a one is to two is to one triplet. Uh, I'm sure it is clear to you. So the two neighbors can both be aligned uh, in good mode and both the neighbors can be in bad mode, opposed to the applied field, one in good mode, one in bad mode, and the other way around is also possible. That is why the ratio is one is to uh, two is to one. Okay, now uh, let's move on to another uh, molecule. Uh, this ortho chloro, I mean uh, alpha chloropropionic acid. It's an AX3 type system where this is A and uh, the CS3 protons are X3. And the methyl protons um, appear as a doublet because uh, they have just one neighbor. It's a one is to one doublet. Whereas this alpha proton, which is highly deshielded because it's alpha to the carboxylic acid and also electronegative uh, you know, halogen, appears as a one is to three is to three is to one um, quartet. And it's a first order coupling. And uh, as we discussed in the previous case, all the three uh, spins of pr protons can be aligned. All the three can be opposed. One uh, opposed, two aligned. There are three way possibilities. Two opposed, one aligned. Again, three possibilities. Therefore, 
the ratio would be 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. It's a first order spectrum and the multiplicity, it follows the multiplicity, general multiplicity um, uh, rule. And as I told you, n is the number of nuclei and i is the uh, spin quantum number. Okay, uh, we can also explain that in terms of Pascal triangle, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. If there is no coupling, a singlet. If there is coupling with one uh, neighbor, one is to one doublet. Coupling with two neighbors, one is to two is to one triplet. Three neighbors, one is to three is to three is to one quartet and so on. And we can use the binomial expansion also for smaller uh, numbers, a plus p the whole square and the coefficients would correspond to the ratio of the intensity of the signals in the multiplet, one is to two is to one in this case. And we can also look at it in a different way. A first couples with say AX, uh, the, these two neighbors are identical. First it forms a doublet, then that doublet is further split into, each line of the doublet is further split into a doublet by the other proton. And theoretically, it could be a quartet, but the center lines uh, merge. Therefore, you get a triplet. That is why it is a 1 is to 2 is to 1 triplet. Okay, and uh, the coupling could be geminal, vicinal, and long range coupling. And the geminal coupling, um, uh, let's take methane. You think there is no coupling, which is not true. There is coupling uh, even among equivalent protons. Only thing is that we won't be able to directly observe it in our spectrum. But we can indirectly uh, measure that instead of proton if you have deuterium because JHH over JHD is 6.53. So proton-proton coupling is 6.53 times more than the proton um, uh, deuterium coupling because uh, of the gamma. Gamma H is 6.53 times uh, of the gamma of deuterium, the gyromagnetic ratio. And in the case of geminal coupling, sometimes you observe negative uh, sign also, which is only of academic interest. And uh, that can be explained if we go uh, to the theory beh behind coupling, which is beyond the scope of, of our discussion today. But just remember that uh, the sign is not that uh, important here. Uh, it is the magnitude. And although it algebraically increases as the electronegativity of the atom increases, you can see here, it increases algebraically as the electronegativity of the atom. It can even be zero as in this case and further increases. Um, and in the case of say formaldehyde, uh, it, the J value could be as high as 42.5, even though we cannot directly uh, measure it because those are two equivalent uh, protons. Now, what about vicinal coupling? And uh, there is a famous equation which many of you, uh, I'm sure, are familiar with. Vicinal coupling is dependent on the dihedral angle between you know, the vicinal protons and the formula that is used uh, is in fact, uh, on the y-axis, you have the j, I should have marked it. And on the x-axis, we have the dihedral angle. So the uh, general formula used um, are, if the um, dihedral angle is between zero and 90 degrees, then j would be 8.5 cos square theta minus 0 0.28. It comes, uh, if it is zero, the j value would be around eight to 11. And if the dihedral angle is 90 to 180 degrees, then it is 9.5 cos square theta minus 0 0.28. And it would be in this range, about 9 to 12 uh, range. And if it is 9, then the J value will be zero. So in the case of vicinal coupling, the J value could be you know, anywhere between zero to uh, about 12 uh, hertz. Uh, again, let us take uh, cyclohexane, or it could be substituted cyclohexane as well. The diaxial coupling is maximum, where the dihedral angle is 180 degrees, that is uh, views from the Kaplan's equation, and the range is about, broad range is 8 to 14 hertz, 
narrow range is about 8 to 12 hertz. In case of diequatorial and axial equatorial, the dihedral angle is 60 degrees and uh, the J value uh, is much lower. The broader range is 1 to 7 hertz, whereas the narrow range is about 2 to 3 hertz. So there is very strong dihedral angle dependence for the uh, coupling constant. Again, cis and trans couplings are different. In the case of cis olefine, the two protons uh, will give a J value of about 7 to 10 hertz, whereas in the case of trans, uh, it's about 12 to 18 hertz. So we can easily determine just from the J value whether a particular olefine is cis trans. Okay, uh, long range couplings are also possible, allylic and other long range couplings, but these are some very interesting uh, couplings. You can see the protons attached to one and three carbons in cyclohexane. Uh, it, uh, if you highlight this, it looks like a W, letter W, right? And the J value is substantial, about one to two hertz. Uh, it could be even higher in the case of a rigid system, such as uh, this Nobone. And uh, endoproton will have very strong coupling with the uh, methylene uh, bridge. Uh, it is very useful in structural you know, determination, uh, especially if you have other substituents. Um, the meta coupling also is like W coupling and it's about one to three uh, hertz. Ortho coupling is of course quite high, vicinal eight hertz, but much less than many other vicinal couplings. And the para coupling is, uh, uh, less than one, one or less. You also see some very unusual couplings, long range coupling, a 4J coupling between these two protons of this rigid propylene, 111 propylene is about 18 Hertz, uh, very high, uh, which is sometimes observed in the case of trans olefins and also in geminal coupling. And a long range coupling, a 9J coupling is observed in this case uh, as well, about measurable J value about 0 0.4 Hertz. And here it is different, it's a fluorine fluorine coupling and also there's a suggestion that it could be due to through, through space interaction. Now we have seen normal first order, uh, you know, quartet that follows the, uh, uh, the uh, Pascal uh, triangle, the multiplicity, the uh, ratio, uh, but suppose, um, you have uh, two protons that are coupled and at very high, or we can start with uh, uh, the low uh, you know, frequency, at 60 megahertz, that coupling may not be visible, assume that it appears as an un unresolved uh, uh, signal. It looks like a singlet. But as you increase the frequency, because go to 100 megahertz, then you see a quarter-like signal appearing. And this need not follow that one is to three is to one ratio, three is to three is to one ratio. And if you further increase the frequency, go to 300 megahertz, then uh, again, the um, better resolution takes place and the signal intensity further varies. It is different from the first order quarter. If you go to much higher uh, frequency, for example, 600 megahertz, then uh, those uh, that quartet uh, gets separated to become uh, two individual doublets. So these quartets are called AB quartets because they are like, uh, uh, you know, the A and B letters of English alphabet that are very close, but then given a chance at high frequency, they get separated. Uh, so one can easily distinguish AB quartet and uh, first order quartet by varying the uh, machine uh, frequency or field strength. So normally the convention followed is that if delta del chemical shift difference between the two uh, doublets is more than 6J, then we have to report it as two individual doublets. If it is less than 6J, we report uh, it as a quartet with the chemical shift specified for both delta A and delta B, which Normally, people uh, sometimes ignore, but strictly speaking, it should be done. And delta A the, and delta B, 
is the uh, center of gravity of this doublet because one signal is smaller and the other is you know larger so one has to calculate the center of gravity and that is done by using this formula nu1 minus nu4 uh, into nu2 minus nu3 and you take the square root so in this case if these are the uh, chemical shift in uh, hertz you uh, calculate and you get 8 hertz so delta del is 8 hertz here Okay, so in this case, delta del is zero. In this case, it is even less than eight hertz. J. Okay, other splitting patterns uh, we should be familiar with. Uh, example, so furfural, the three ring protons have uh, AMX pattern. And uh, you see uh, three bunches of double double X of equal intensity. And that's because uh, the nucleus A, proton A, couples with EX to form a doublet. So this can also be called coupling tree. And this doublet is further split into, each line of that doublet is further split into doublet because of coupling with M. And so A, J, A, M. And you get two separate doublets. So uh, similarly, M also couples with EX to form a doublet, J, E, M, X. And each line of the doublet is further split into a doublet, uh, J, A, M. Again, a doublet, doublet. And if you measure this spacing and this spacing should be identical. So that way you can confirm which are the, uh, you know, doublets. Uh, now let us take X, the third uh, proton. It, it couples with uh, M. Uh, you will see, you will have a doublet. Of course, you cannot uh, see that as a separate uh, signal because it further uh, splits to uh, a doublet, J, A, S. And uh, uh, again, you, will, uh, you get a double doublet. Is everything all right? Yeah, I guess so. Someone unmuted that. Okay. But I am audible, right? Okay. And the slides are visible. You are audible. Yeah. You are okay. audible and visible. Okay, thank you. So you get three bunches of double doublets uh, in this case. And there is internal consistency as well because you can measure this JAX here as well. Similarly, JMX can be measured here. Similarly, JAM can be measured here. Uh, so it's a you get a, a three bunches of signals, 12 lines of equal uh, intensity. Now, suppose instead of J, A, M, X, uh, so A, M, and X are like three well-separated English alphabets, so three uh, bunches of double double X well-separated. And suppose two of them come together, instead of A, M, and X, suppose A and M come together to become A, B. Then the pattern slightly changes. So AB uh, comes as a single bunch of eight lines and uh, X comes uh, well separated. So this is ABX pattern. Now it's also possible that the chemical shift of C uh, of, the, of X is also closer to A and B, in which case we call it ABC and this will become closer. And you will see... Uh, instead of 12 lines, sometimes even 15 lines, because some uh, additional transitions take place. Again, uh, the theory behind is probably beyond the scope of uh, this discussion. Now, uh, other cases are also observed in simple organic molecules. Let us take uh, metadi I mean, orthodinitrobenzene. The, strictly speaking, the pattern at high resolution is, is a, A prime, X, X prime. Um, in the case of orthodinitrobenzene or, um, you know, symmetrically ortho disubstituted compounds or unsymmetrically para disubstituted compounds of this type with strongly electron withdrawing or donating groups. Then only you will see well separation of signals. So there are four uh, unequal coupling constants A, A prime. A, A prime, AX, 
a x prime and x x prime these are all different even though chemical shift of a and a prime are same identical new a and new a prime are identical similarly new x and new x prime chemical shifts are uh, identical uh, and but we know that j a x is not equal to j a prime x because j a a x is ortho coupling j a prime x is meta coupling similarly uh, j a x is not equal to j x prime again it's ortho and meta coupling so that uh, causes uh, this uh, you know uh, difference and in this case 24 lines are observed theoretically four could be degenerate therefore up to 20 lines two bunches of 10 lines each for a a prime and x x prime are observed those are independently symmetric and we need to consider all the possible allowed transitions for the four spin system in order to get these uh, this number and suppose as in the case of ab ax and ab if the nuclei come closer their chemical shifts are uh, you know very close um, then a a prime could collapse to a a prime x x prime could collapse to a a prime b b prime for example in this case like chlorobenzene less uh, electron negative atoms or in this case you would see a a prime b b prime uh, type of pattern where again new a new a prime are identical and new b and new b prime are identical but their couplings are different so j a b is not equal to j a b prime and j a prime b is not equal to j a prime b prime one is ortho coupling and the other is meta coupling and here the signals will not be independently symmetric but the entire system would be symmetrical and uh, you know um, again up to 20 lines are observed in such cases but uh, you know at lower resolution this could also become a simple ab type or ax type uh, you know pattern now um, we should also uh, you know explain what is meant by chemical and magnetic non equivalence so chemical doesn't mean that chemical uh, nothing to do with chemical properties but chemical shift if you take this n and dimethyl acetamide the two uh, n methyl protons have different chemical shifts uh, one 2.88 the other is 2.97 that's because the n c bond has partial double bond character because of the resonance and uh, the methyl group on the side of the uh, oxygen or minus because of the greater electron density experiences a shielding effect whereas the other methyl group uh, experiences uh, relatively you know uh, a relative de shielding effect so these two methyl groups can be called chemically non equivalent because they have uh, different chemical shifts similarly these two protons uh, how do uh, we call them these two protons can be called this is a chiral center you can see four different groups attached to this carbon hydrogen methyl and bromine therefore these two protons are diastereotopic because if you replace one of the protons with another uh, group x you will get one diastereomer if you replace the other proton with a group x you will get another diastereomer because then you will have two chiral centers that will give you two different diastereomers therefore the two protons are called diastereotopic and they are chemically non equivalent again similarly these two protons are also diastereotopic because one has they will have different chemical shifts and different couplings uh, as well because of two different groups on the other side now what about uh, magnetic non equivalence the protons can be or nuclei can be chemically equivalent that means identical chemical shift at the same time magnetically non equivalent uh, let's take uh, this 12 uh, dibromoethane a simple molecule looks uh, that it appears as though all the protons are uh, you know identical but that is not true if you uh, restrict the 
conformation or the rotation about this carbon carbon bond it's possible that um, at some point the uh, the geminal methylenes can have different couplings for example this proton has bromine at 180 degrees whereas this proton has another proton at 180 degrees and 180 degree coupling is very strong so the vicinal cup this proton has a 180 degree vicinal coupling with another proton whereas this proton doesn't have it only has 60 degree couplings that makes these two protons magnetically non equivalent even though chemically equivalent similar examples can be seen uh, in this case uh, as well uh, here the uh, difluoroethylene or we can start with this uh, Difluoromethane. This is this has a two x two pattern because H one F three and H two F three are identical. Similarly, H one F four and H two F four are identical. Uh, and in the case of aline as well, H one F three and H one F four are identical because the two pi electron clouds are perpendicular to each other. So the both of them have a two x two pattern. But that is not true in the case of olefin, difluoroethylene, because H1F3 and H1F4 are different. Similarly, um, H2F3 and H2F4 are also different. Therefore, uh, you have AA prime, XX prime pattern for this. Of course, the fluorine will be observed in fluorine NMR only. That's the only difference. Now, um, I think we have uh, explained uh, the chemical shift and uh, coupling couplings of uh, uh, proton. Quickly, let us look at the chemical shifts of some carbons. And sorry about the quality of the slide. I just picked up from uh, one of my old, uh, you know, uh, class notes. Uh, it, just for information, um, most of you must be familiar with. I think I hope you are running on time. Uh, uh, so these are the, we have seen the chemical shift range is uh, altogether different for carbon. It is about uh, 0 to 200 or 250. Uh, it can go even up to 400. And in this uh, propane, you can see the terminal metals have uh, slightly, uh, are slightly shielded, whereas the methylene is deshielded. If you have one more methylene, the methylenes are deshielded, 25. The methyl groups are shielded. Because more protons attached, electroprogressive protons attached. Here, olefinic uh, range is about 120 to 160, and this comes at 127. Allylic carbon, slightly uh, deshielded compared to the other methylene. Aromatic carbon, 128. Uh, olefinic carbons, depending upon number of protons attached, whether it is internal or terminal, chemical shift varies. 115, 135. Uh, methyl, it appears highly shielded, 19. Ethylene carbons appear in this range, uh, you know, 120 to 140 range. Uh, other alicyclic compounds, if there is an electronegative atom attached, it's about 68. Here, only 26. Again, electroneg effect of electronegative nitrogen, 47 for this carbon, whereas only 26 for this carbon. Now, in the case of fused aromatic systems, uh, at the ring junction, the carbon could be uh, deshielded, 136, whereas only 128 here. Then the effect of uh, the electronegative atom is seen here. The adjacent carbon is highly deshielded, 150, whereas uh, only 126 here. And this carbon is uh, like a para substituent. You know, the effect, this is like having an electronegative electron withdrawing substituent at the para position. Therefore, this is uh, deshielded. Now, you can also uh, see uh, in uh, heteroaromatic systems, uh, other heteroaromatic systems like furan, 144 here, whereas 111 here, 136 here because of two nitrogens and 122 here. And uh, uh, we can also you know, look at the chemical shifts of uh, more substituted aromatic systems. A strongly electron withdrawing group such as OH group 
makes this carbon highly de-shielded, or 160. Uh, whereas the ortho carbon is the most shielded because you know the uh, the resonance uh, effect, the electron uh, oxygen donates has a mesomeric effect, donates its lone pair of electrons towards the ring, and metal is relatively de-shielded, uh, de and this is the uh, carbon, uh, the ipso carbon, where acetyl group is attached. So we can even distinguish these three based on the number of uh, uh, signals observed in carbon-13 NMR. As in the case of proton, acetylenic carbons are also de-shielded uh, shielded compared to you know, olefinic carbons. So in acetylene, uh, the chemical shift is about 72 for the carbon. And similarly, you know, other uh, groups, uh, depending upon their environment, the chemical shifts would vary. Uh, you know, in methyl group attached to aromatic system, 2021, 20, uh, if there is an oxygen in the middle, then it goes to 56, dramatic change, uh, example, anisole. Uh, in the case of alkyl ethers, it's about 59. And here, uh, acetyl methyl comes in this range about 25 to 30. Uh, ester methyl 50 to 55, uh, methyl of an amide about 24, if the methyl is attached to nitrogen then it's about 30 to 40. Again uh, in the case of charged nitrogen it is slightly higher but up to 45 and we have seen similar examples. So uh, I think one, sh one need not know the exact chemical shift but if one knows the approximate range uh, one can work out, um, you know, the, uh, in fact, uh, solve the structure. So structure determination is something like this. You know, we need to find the way, the rabbit needs to find the way to reach uh, the carrot. Okay, I, now what I will do is, I think I have finished uh, uh, an hour now. Uh, we had some interruptions in the middle. I think, uh, so can I spend another half an hour uh, or more? Uh, Professor Anil Kumar, how much time do I have? Yes, I think yes. Okay. Yeah, you can. Yes, yes. No problem. You can. Half an hour is okay. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, what I will do is uh, I will first pick up some structures of compounds synthesized in our own laboratory um, and explain their proton and C13 data. We will not get into other NMR uh, techniques like 2D, uh, this today because uh, the time is limited. Um, and then we will also try to solve some simple, uh, or arrive at the structure of some simple organic uh, molecules. Uh, from the data uh, we have. So here, I hope the spectrum is uh, clear. Uh, I have this structure. So this is prepared by adding uh, bromoform to nitro uh, styrene, para nitro styrene. And you can see, I mean, most of you should be able to assign the uh, these signals. So in the aromatic region, you can see about 7.5 to 8.5. Uh, ideally, it should be AA prime XX prime or AA prime BB prime. But what we see is two doublets, uh, two well separated doublets, um, and that is the pattern. Sometimes uh, we observe for such unsymmetrically paradise substituted systems. So aromatic region is assigned. Then we have this uh, methylene and a methane proton, three protons. And that, those three protons, we have seen the patterns. It could be AMX or uh, ABX or ABC. And you, you see sufficient separation of the three signals, one proton each. So uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the expansion. But this pattern is quite similar to uh, AMX. You will see similar pattern in alpha amino acids uh, as well. In other words, uh, each proton couples with the other two. And uh, so you will see that double double pattern, which we have seen in the case of um, uh, 
uh, furfural. Now, the corresponding carbon-13 signal is uh, shown here. So how many uh, aliphatic carbons? So we have one, two, three, three aliphatic carbons. And which, is, which one is the most shielded? The one with the three bromine atoms, heavy bromine atoms, electron-rich uh, bromine, which comes around 40, this carbon. And that is also a small signal because no protons attached, so it will have long relaxation time. And then you have the benzylic carbon coming at about 63.7 here. Then you also have the nitromethyl carbon. This methylene will be highly deshielded because uh, of the nitro group. And that comes along with the uh, CDCL3 peak. It comes around 77.7 .7 or so. Then we have, uh, and remember there is a symmetry uh, for the aromatic ring. Therefore, one, two, three, four. Only four signals will be observed. And from the intensity, we can make out that these are the quaternary carbons. The other two are the, uh, strictly speaking, you can assign all the carbons uh, because the most deshielded one would be the nitro group attached, this one. The, the next one would be this carbon, the quaternary. Then the other two can also be assigned uh, because the ortho to uh, nitro would be highly deshielded compared to uh, the other one. So all the uh, signals can be assigned. In fact, in NMR, uh, Unlike uh, mass, IR, uh, spectra, uh, all the signals are supposed to be assigned in NMR. Let's take another example. Uh, so this uh, is an analog of curcumin. Curcumin is the yellow pigment in turmeric, which uh, we can prepare from uh, acetyl acetone and uh, aromatic aldehyde by condensation. Uh, so this is not the natural one but you can see the substituents and it is symmetrical. And the 1,3-dicarbonyl uh, group can get enolized and become uh, like this in the enolic form. And there are no aliphatic uh, proto uh, protons except the methyl protons. And you can see there is symmetry because uh, the OH proton can shuttle between the two uh, oxygens. So there is symmetry. But these two methoxy groups are different. So they come, uh, you know, separately. So you have two sets of methyl groups. Then uh, you can assign the olefinic uh, protons, these two, and this is a trans olefin, E olefin, and with a J value of, uh, you know, 16 to 18 hertz. These two doublets, one here and one here. Then you have, um, you can see a singlet quite shielded and that singlet could be this one because it's quite, uh, you know, electron rich. It's in conjugation with the lone pair on uh, OH. Then you have three other, one, two, three other aromatic protons and this would appear as a singlet. You can see here, this one. And then you have two, uh, so metacoupling is not observed, <clears throat> at least uh, in the in this spectrum. And these two protons, uh, one is ortho to methoxy, that could be the shielded one. Uh, one doublet can be seen here. The other one is meta to both methoxies, that is here. And this is the residual chloroform peak. And then at 16, close to 16, Around 16, you have the OH proton. So all the protons have been assigned. <clears throat> so this is based on just logic, based on the chemical shift pattern we have seen, you know, we have just uh, discussed. Uh, similarly, carbon-13 can also be assigned. Um, you can see the uh, methoxy, even though there are two kinds of methoxy carbons, they are coming together because the difference is not felt much, coming at about 55, uh, 55, 56. 
then all other carbons are in the aromatic uh, olefinic region. Now one can easily assign uh, them how many carbons uh, are there. Uh, you have six from the aromatic ring, seven, eight, nine, ten. So ten carbons. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All the ten carbons are there. Now one can, in principle, try to assign uh, all of them. So uh, the most deshielded one is the carbonyl, 183 or 184, most deshielded one. Then these two appearing at around 160 are for the carbons uh, uh, with a um, methoxy group attached. And because of the electronegativity of oxygen, those carbons will be highly deshielded. Highly deshielded. Then we have the um, several shielded carbons. Because of the methoxy group, the aromatic carbons will be shielded. You know, these 98 could be ortho to uh, ortho to ortho or para to the uh, ortho to both methoxies or or ortho to one methoxy and para to the other. That's possible. And the smaller ones are the uh, one here and uh, one here. So these uh, carbons. Sorry, uh, the the, the quaternary one. And you also have uh, other olefinic carbons which come in this range. So uh, it will take some time if you need to assign each one perfectly, but I hope you get the uh, get a feeling. Let's move on to um, another structure. Again, this uh, is a pyrazol alkaloid which we have uh, synthesized in our laboratory called Vithasomnin. Uh, it is present in, uh, you know, Ashwagandha, the, um, the medicine, its medicine, botanical name is Vithenia somnifera. Uh, it is used in Ayurvedic medicines. So we have synthesized this in our laboratory uh, following our own, uh, you know, methodology. And we can assign the proton NMR first, uh, the most shielded bunch, this methylene, is this, uh, and that comes as a quintet because it has, uh, you know, four neighbors. Then you have the next uh, triplet, this one, this uh, methylene, which is a benzylic type. Then you have a deshielded uh, methylene triplet, which is ENCH2, okay? And the most deshielded signal coming at around 7.8 is the pyrazol uh, CH which is like an imine proton. And then you have the aromatic uh, protons here. You have the, uh, the para one, then ortho two, again, meta two. So all of them can be assigned. You also have the chloroform signal here. Similarly, the carbon 13 signal can also be assigned. Uh, you have three methylenes uh, in the adiphatic region. And the most deshielded one is NCH2. NCH2. The other two can be distinguished in principle, even though chemical shift is on, difference is only about 3 ppm. And I will assign tentatively the most deshielded one, most shielded one would be this, and then the other one, the benzylic type. So all of them have been assigned. And how many peaks will be seen in the uh, aromatic region? Four for the uh, aromatic, uh, the benzene ring, and one, two, three for the uh, pyrosol carbons. So seven. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven carbons. Out of seven carbons, we have one, two, three, four quaternary carbons. And they can be easily identified. One, two, three, four. This can be confirmed by another experiment called APT or depth, but it is not really necessary. And uh, uh, after the, those four carbons have been assigned, we are left with uh, three uh, others. Yeah, the aromatic and the, uh, in fact, one, two, three, four others. One, 
two, sorry, one, two, three, three quaternary carbons, one, two, and three, and then four methane carbons, three from the aromatic ring and one from the pyrosol. And the pyrosol CH could be this. Okay. Uh, another uh, one or two more examples. Uh, this is uh, another uh, interesting uh, natural product, uh, again synthesized in our laboratory. It's an antifungal agent called isoparvifuran. And uh, the uh, proton NMR is shown here. So we have two kinds of methyl groups here. And you can see uh, the, anisot the, uh, the, the effect of, uh, you know, the atom attached to the protons or the uh, electronegativity of the uh, oxygen here. In this, uh, this methyl appears at about 2.5. Whereas uh, this methoxy methyl appears at 3.9. So there is a large difference in chemical shift. Then you have the OH proton coming here. It's slightly uh, broad, the signal. And then you also have uh, five uh, phenyl protons and two other aromatic uh, protons. So these two aromatic protons are coming here. And then five phenyl protons, one here and four here. So all uh, have been you know, accounted for. The corresponding carbon-13 uh, looks uh, like this. And uh, they are peaks are well separated. Uh, the methyl this methyl carbon comes here at about 13, whereas the methoxy methyl comes in the 50, uh, around 55, 56.5 very readily distinguishable. Then uh, how many uh, aromatic carbons? So we have six from the benzo group, two from the furan ring, eight, and four from the uh, phenyl, so 12. There should be 12, but I think we'll see only 11. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11, only 11. So there is uh, some overlapping, and that can be seen from the intensity of uh, the signal, even though uh, intensity of carbon signal depends on the relaxation times, tentatively we can uh, you know, consider that this is for uh, you know, two carbons. And of course, uh, with some effort, one can assign the individual carbons as well. And unfortunately, we don't have that much time. I think this is the last structure I wanted to show, show you. And after that, we will discuss a few uh, unknown examples, uh, compounds. Again, this is a drug molecule we have synthesized in our laboratory uh, uh, following our own methodology. Uh, it's called Alpidem. It's an used for treatment of anxiety uh, disorder, anxiolytic drug. Uh, it's called, uh, yeah, Alpidem. And uh, you can uh, see the proton NMR here. Signals are well uh, separated. The, interestingly, uh, the two propyl groups attached to nitrogen appear differently in proton NMR. And that is because you, you may remember that in the case of N and dimethyl acetamide, the two methyls attached to nitrogen are different. They are chemically different because of the partial uh, double bond character for uh, this NC bond. The same thing is observed here as well. The two methyl groups, the triplets, are uh, appearing differently because the methyl couples with methylene form a triplet. They're appearing differently. And uh, the uh, next methylene uh, couples with three methyl group, I mean methyl protons and two methylene protons, so five, should appear as a sextet. In fact, those two are coming together. Methylene of both uh, are overlapping for uh, four protons. Uh, sextet. Then the NCS2s. Uh, before that, you have the uh, this CS2 as well. This CS2 is coming here as a singlet because uh, it doesn't couple with any other proton. Then NCS2. NCS2 should come as a triplet. And you see two triplets. Again, well separated triplets because uh, one methylene is on the on on the on the same side of the carbonyl, the other is on the 
other side of the carbon ion because of the partial double bond character. So all of them, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this signal is not for uh, this methylene. This is uh, water, water in uh, CdCl3. Uh, the NC, uh, this methylene is here. Is here about around 4, 4.1, because it is flanked by a carbonyl group and also uh, an aromatic system. Therefore, it is highly uh, deshielded. This should be ignored is due to water. And so similarly, one can also assign the aromatic region. Uh, you have, uh, as I told you, uh, the this is a para disubstituted system, and uh, the groups are not very strongly electron donating or withdrawing. So the simplified pattern observed is like A B, and you can see here these. Uh, tall uh, four lines with internal lines with higher intensity and the uh, lines outside with lower intensity. So the, an AB type of quartet is observed for uh, the uh, aromatic parachlorophenyl uh, ring. Then we have uh, this proton, which is isolated. Uh, it, it, it is looks like a singlet. Uh, if, if at all it has coupling, it is very small, meta coupling. Then the other uh, two protons are also observed here. One is here and one is overlapping with the AB quartet. And you have the chloroform signal. So all the peaks can be uh, assigned. And this is the um, uh, corresponding carbon-13 uh, NMR. And in the aliphatic region, we have six, seven signals, because the two propyl groups are different, then you have the methylene as well. So two, four, five, six, seven signals. The aromatic region has, uh, let's see how many carbonyl comes at about one, it's an amide carbonyl, and uh, there is electron density towards the carbonyl oxygen, so it is shielded compared to other carbonyl groups, but deshielded compared to aromatic carbons, about 167 or so. Uh, and we can count the number of uh, carbons uh, possible for the aromatic uh, region, four for this, and then two, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There should be eleven in this region. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There are eleven carbons here. And with some effort, one can uh, assign, uh, you know, all the carbons. And it is now the subjective assignment is not that uh, important because now softwares are available even to assign. Uh, even using ChemDraw, one can make a tentative assignment. But it is always good to know how to, uh, you know, assign these signals. And due to, in the interest of time, I will now quickly uh, switch to a few examples. Just to wanted to tell you that uh, if you're not sure of a uh, carbon signal, whether it is methylene or methyl or methane, you can do an APT experiment and distinguish uh, carbons bearing even number of protons and odd number of protons. For example, the C5 uh, methylene is coming downward, C5. Similarly, the carbonyl, uh, methylene carbon. Carbonyl carbon is also coming downward. Both have odd number of, even number of protons. This doesn't have any protons, zero. This has two. Whereas the methyl groups have odd number of protons. They're coming upward. This methyl is here, and this methyl is here. Similarly, CH, odd number of protons, olefinic. This uh, CH, here and this the beta CH is here deshielded. Now let us. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you want to respond. Uh, if anyone can respond to these simple uh, questions in the chat box or uh, uh, by unmuting, uh, I have few uh, simple problems. So match the proton NMR chemical shifts of the non-deuterated solvent impurities in the following deuterated solvents. CdCl3, acetone D6, DMSO D6, methanol D4. Um, so uh, 
what is the chemical shift for chloroform in CDCL3? Among these, 2.17, 3.40, 7.25, 2.62. .2. Anyone can answer in the chat box or uh, 7.25, that is correct. Uh, correct. Acetone D6. Yeah, I got many answers on point two five. Acetone D6. Among these, 2.17, that is correct. Uh, not uh, 2.6. So, what about DMSO D6? DMSO D6. 2.17 is for acetone. Uh, okay. DMSO D6, 2.6. Uh, no, not 3.40. 3.40 is for ethanol uh, D4. So all the, you know, we, we should know. Whenever we, uh, you know, analyze uh, proton and MR, we should know where the residual impurity solvent peak will uh, appear. The corresponding carbon signals, quickly, benzene D6, among these. So you have the solvents here and uh, the chemical shifts here. Benzene D6. We will come to the questions later. Let us complete uh, this. Uh, where will benzene? D6 carbon appear. It is CL3 77. Acetone D6, 29.2 and 204.4 because 29.2 is for the methyl group and 204.1 is for the carbonyl. DMSO D6, 39.6 and the methanol D4, 49.3. Uh, and benzene D6 is left. Is, uh, sorry, it's 128.4. Someone has already answered. Okay, here's another uh, problem. The proton NMR spectrum of a compound with molecular formula C6H10O2 has two singlets with an area ratio of 2.2 is to 3. Identify the compound. The information uh, given seems to be very limited, but it is not that difficult. Can anyone uh, suggest a compound? The molecular formula is given. And it has only two signals, two singlets with a two is to three ratio. From the molecular formula, one can calculate the double bond equivalence, right? The degree of unsaturation. So, what is the degree of unsaturation for this compound? Can anyone suggest the degree of unsaturation? Very good. Two. That's because. 14 CNA, 14 minus 10 divided by 2. Degree of unsaturation is 2. So the, the, uh, there are two double bonds or one ring and a double bond or two rings. And then uh, the signals are singlets in 2 is to 3 ratio. That means what could be the, uh, the groups? The groups could be methylene and methyl. Two methylene protons and three methyl protons. So the compound, the structure could be this. You have two methyl groups and two methylene. So two is to three is the ratio of methylene protons and methyl protons. Another possibility is this. And you have two double bonds here, two carbonyl. Here also you have two uh, equivalent to two double bonds. The degree of unsaturation is two. A triple bond is considered as single bond plus two double bonds. So these are simple uh, problems. Let us take another. Can you distinguish between the three isomeric dichlorocyclopropanes by the number of signals in proton and 13C? Three isomeric dichlorocyclopropanes. Can we, can we distinguish them from the number of protons and 13C? These are the dichlorocyclopropanes. So you have 1,1 and 1,2. 
and 1 2 dichlorocyclopropane can be either cis or trans and uh, um, in cis what is the symmetry element present and in trans what is the symmetry element present that will help so the consideration of symmetry uh, is very important while assigning the uh, spectrum so in cis there is a plane of symmetry and in trans there is a c2 axis so whether you have plane of symmetry or c2 axis that will reduce the number of signals in proton and uh, so which method is uh, suitable for distinguishing these uh, isomers proton or carbon 13 so i will uh, in proton here you will see only one signal because these two methylenes are uh, equivalent. Here you will see three signals because uh, these two uh, methane protons are equivalent. Then you have these two methylene protons. One will be above, one will be below. So you have three kinds of signals. Whereas here, these two uh, methane protons are uh, equivalent. Uh, and these two are also equal, one above, one below. Therefore, you will see only two signals. So the three isomers can be distinguished based on the number of proton and MR signals, one, three, two. Whereas it, it would be very difficult with carbon-13. You will have identical number of signals, even though chemical shifts will vary in the case of carbon-13. This will have two, one for this and one for this. Again, one for this, one for this. One for this, one for this. So from carbon number of carbon-13 signals, it would be very difficult to distinguish. Let us take another example. Can you distinguish between the two isomers A and B by 13 CNMR? Uh, if yes, how? So here you can see the, the OH uh, groups are below the plane. Here they are above the plane and the oxa bridge is above the plane. The, the methyl groups are at the, uh, at the bridge head. Here, all the OH groups are above the plane. Oxa bridge is also above the plane. Methyl groups are at the bridge head. Can we make a distinguish, uh, distinction between these two based on carbon-13 NMR? Just look at the symmetry again. Here, you have a horizontal uh, plane of symmetry, which uh, therefore, you will have half the number of signals, one, two, three, four signals only, because these four are equivalent to the other four mirror images. So four lines. How many lines will be seen here? Here we have two levels of uh, symmetry, plane of symmetry. You have a horizontal plane and also a vertical plane of symmetry. That further decreases the number of uh, carbons, uh, signals, one, two, three only. So four lines in this case and only three lines in this case. Okay, uh, uh, another couple of uh, problems that 13 CNMR of uh, data of a compound with molecular formula C11H22O is given below. Propose a suitable structure. Again, uh, one has to uh, calculate, determine the uh, double bond equivalence or degree of unsaturation. So what is the degree of unsaturation here? C11H22O. Anyone? One, CNH2N plus two. So 24 minus 22, that is two divided by two, one. So one is the degree of unsaturation, it's very good. Uh, and you see, there are 11 carbons from the molecular formula but only six signals are reported. Only six signals are reported. That means there is symmetry, right? There is a symmetry. Molecule is symmetrical. And we can now, uh, the chemical shifts are provided. There is a peak at 210.8, which is certainly due to carbonyl group. So there is a one carbonyl carbon at 210.8, and there's a highly shielded uh, signal at 14.1. Quartet means, there are three protons attached to that. Uh, triplet means two protons attached. 
Doublet means one proton attached and singlet means zero proton attached. And so you have one methyl group appearing at 14.1 and then the others are methylenes. So you might have got the structure uh, already. So this is a structure, symmetrical. So these two methyls are equivalent coming at 14.1, carbonyl coming at 210.8, and then you have one, two, three, four methylenes. All are coming as triplets, one, two, three, four. And you can even assign their relative uh, you know, chemical shifts. The most deshielded one would be the one that is close to the carbonyl group. And then it uh, you know, uh, decreases or gets more shielded. Quickly, CNN, H10, O. You have the proton NMR and carbon 13 NMR. What could be the structure? So, what is the double bond equivalence? Yes, yes, I can provide the PPTs, not a problem. What is the double bond equivalence in this case? Five, very good. Uh, Double bond equivalence is 5. Cn H2n N plus 2 is uh, 20, right? So 20 minus 10 uh, is 10 divided by 2. Double bond equivalence is 5. Uh, now, now look at the data. So this initial exercise, everyone has to do that. In the case of uh, when you have a molecular formula, you have to calculate the double bond equivalence or degree of unsaturation. That gives a very important clue with regard to the structure. Now let us look at the uh, chemical shifts. Um, so you have 2.1 as a singlet, and it is certainly a methyl group. And since, since it is coming around 2, it, it could be an acetyl methyl, because if it is ethane has a chemical shift below 1, right, uh, 0.88, and uh, methoxy will be in the 3 to 4 range and so on. So since it is coming around 2, it could be an acetyl methyl group. That means carbonyl group attached. Then uh, there's a singlet at 3.6. Singlet at 3.6. That means uh, it is a deshielded methylene. And there could be, uh, since there are aromatic protons, it could be ARCH2. And we know it also has a carbonyl group. So that carbonyl group may be further, uh, you know, deshielding that or connected to that. So we have some clues. We have an acetyl methyl group. We have an aromatic uh, ring, and that it is phenyl, five protons coming as a multiplet. Then we have a methylene, right? So methyl, methylene, aromatic ring, carbonyl. From that, one can work out the structure, phenyl. So the Structure, I think I have uh, not even utilized uh, the carbon 13 data, uh, which is not really necessary, but we can always compare the data. The peak coming at 15 as a quartet is the methyl. That coming at 50, again, aliphatic region as a triplet is methylene, and it is flanked by the aromatic ring and the carbonyl group. The corresponding proton chemical shift is 3.6. And then you have one, two, three, uh, four uh, aromatic carbons. And the singular is for this one, the quaternary carbon. So it is quite uh, simple. And the one or two examples we have, C11H13NO. So you have the, and we didn't have any problem with, uh, um, with uh, coupling constants. So we have it here. And for simplicity, I have rounded off the chemical shifts to one decimal place and coupling constants to zero decimal place. Uh, but strictly speaking, uh, you, you need to report chemical shifts with two decimal places and coupling constants with one decimal place. Uh, so C11S13NO, what is the double bond equivalence? Anyone? Very good. Double bond equivalence is six. Six. Okay. The other information, proton NMR, you have a six protons at 3.1. And we have seen acetyl methyl comes around two. 
the toxic metal comes uh, between uh, around 3.5 to 4 so this could be ncs3 nme2 it could be nme2 nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen then you have uh, at 7 you uh, at 7 you have an abq type of signal with a j value of around 8 and we have seen for ortho coupling j value is 8 hertz and uh, there are four protons. That means it is para disubstituted and para unsymmetrically disubstituted, right? Unsymmetrically para disubstituted phenyl ring. Then we have a peak at 9.6 for one proton. And we have seen from the chemical shift values, it could be aldehyde. Aldehyde CH comes around uh, 9 to 10. And it also couples, it has a J value of 9 hertz. It couples with an olefinic proton at 6.6. .6. You see, this single proton, aldehyde proton, 9 hertz, couples with this olefinic proton that is coming at 6.6. .6. That means that olefinic proton is alpha to the carbonyl. Alpha to the carbonyl. Okay. Then at 6.6 .6 and 7.4, we have two protons. And one of them is coupling with the aldehyde CH. The other is not coupling. Other is coupling only with the uh, vicinal olefinic proton. And that J value is 16 hertz. 16 hertz means it is trans coupling. It's an E double bond, trans double bond, right? So I think we have now a lot of information. So you have an aromatic ring with a NN dimethyl amino group on one side and an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde on the other side. So basically it is a uh, we could also analyze the carbon 13. At 40, uh, you have a quartet, which is methyl. It is NME. Now we know from proton and MR. Then at, you have a peak at 195, which is a doublet. Uh, therefore, it is an aldehyde peak, highly de shielded. Then at 122 and 154, 122 and 154, we have singlets. And those are aromatic singlets, you know, aromatic quaternary carbons. Then at 112, we have a doublet, and that is the most uh, shielded among the aromatic carbons. And that can be assigned to the ortho carbon, uh, carbon ortho to the NME2 group. At 152, we have a, a, again a doublet, most deshielded doublet. And that is certainly beta to CHO. You know, beta to CHO is electropositive. There is a delta positive charge. Michael addition takes place at the beta position of alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde. So the structure is now very clear. It is uh, para nn dimethyl amino cinnam aldehyde, right? So I think we have, uh, uh, yeah, I think I probably took a, a 15 minutes extra, but we had some trouble in the beginning. So now if you have any questions, uh, I can, I will try to answer. There are plenty of books. I may have a list, a list but uh, I can maybe pick up from another file. Okay. And thank you, sir, for the uh, nice presentation. Very elaborate and uh, clear. Uh, students have uh, posted it. I'll just read it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on the magnetically equivalent, equivalence of allenes and non-equivalence of CH2F2? Okay, maybe I can go to that. Allenes and CH2. Okay, so here uh, in CH2F2, the H coupling of H1 with F3 and H1 with F4 are identical, equivalent. Similarly, H2 uh, with F3 and H2 with F4 are, are also equivalent. Therefore, H1 and H2 are magnetically equivalent. Their couplings with the two other fluorines are identical. Therefore, they are not only chemically equivalent, they are also magnetically equivalent. Magnetic equivalence means Coupling should be different. Chemical shift would be same. Coupling would be different. But in this case, CH2F2 
and uh, in this case a lien uh, similarly here h1 f3 and h1 f4 couplings are identical because uh, only when you take the aline model you will realize that these two pi electron clouds are perpendicular so when h1 looks at it at f3 and f4 f3 and f4 are are identical therefore j h1 f3 and j h1 f4 are identical similarly h2 f3 and h2 f4 are also identical therefore h1 and h2 are magnetically equivalent so a2 x2 pattern for these two but that doesn't hold good in the case of alkene because this is uh, you know the these two have this relationship but these two have trans relationship i hope that is clear that all right no i think yes uh participants can put uh, your questions in the chat box box yeah there is one question could you please suggest the book for elaborated problem solving approach manaj tattam tattam is asking um i think silverstein bastler is a very good book for uh, this purpose I, what, do you, what do you think about Morrison and Boyd? That is the one I used to study. You know, when I was in a physics oh. class. Yeah, Morrison and Boyd is a general chemistry, organic chemistry book. But if you want a book on NMR spectrosco uh, spectroscopy mm -hmm. uh, in general or NMR spectroscopy in particular, uh, yeah, Silverstein Bastler is very good. I may also have few other. Uh, let me see whether I can. There is one more question. Can you please yeah. explain how to identify shielded and de-shielded protons? Shielded and de-shielded protons. Proton. Yeah, Vincent Joseph is asking. Oh, okay, based on where they appear in the spectrum, right? It is relative. When you say shielded and de-shielded, it's relative. So chemical shift of uh, EMS is taken as standard. That is zero. Suppose with respect to uh, uh, TMS, if we discuss the peak appearing on the left uh, would be de-shielded, peaks appearing, uh, which is very rare, on the right of TMS would be shielded. And we can take another, if you take the solvent peak as a standard, like in chloroform, HCl3, any peak appearing on the left of chloroform would be de-shielded. And those appearing on the right would be shielded. So it is uh, relative to a particular uh, signal. And that shielding, shielding is, uh, has to do with the electron cloud around that nucleus. Even though NMR is a nuclear phenomenon, electrons have a major role to play. So depending upon the electron cloud around the nucleus, the chemical shift would vary. Yeah. yeah. So we see the question is: it, is, is the shielding dependent on the electronegativity of the atoms? Yes. Yes. The shielding depends on factors, as as we have discussed, on the electronegativity of the uh, atom attached. Mainly on electronegativity and electron cloud around uh, uh, around that nucleus, and how the uh, the nucleus or the molecule orients in an applied magnetic field. So we have discussed this polar effect, hydrogen bonding effect, and other anisotropic effects. Um, so uh, the chemical shift depends on all these factors. So that's why I decided to briefly discuss all these aspects in the beginning uh, before we go to, uh, you know, example. Mm -hmm. So but basically, the environment uh, around the nucleus matters, affects the yeah. chemical shift. One Gogol is asking, sir, why identifying isolated compounds from natural products 
what's your suggestion for elucidating the structure, steps like that? Uh, for structure elucidation of natural products, you know. So uh, NMR uh, may not be enough. NMR is still the most powerful technique uh, to elucidate the structure. We may need additional information from mass, for example, molecular uh, mass of the compound. And some information can be gathered from, uh, say, uh, IR. What are the functional groups present? Uh, so a combined, uh, you know, um, data, a composite data would be helpful when we try to analyze unknown compounds, especially complex natural products. And the natural product could also uh, may not be a homogeneous compound. Sometimes you may think it's a homogeneous compound. So we need uh, LC or DC data to confirm that the sample is pure. pure. You know, chemically uh, and even isomerically pure. But otherwise, if you try to analyze a mixture, then we will have very complex NMR pattern, and we will not have, we will not get uh, any useful information. So homogeneity of the sample is uh, has to be confirmed before we try to analyze by NMR. Otherwise, we should know at least what kind of mixture it is. Mm -hmm. So for the for the diastereo protons, apart from coupling constant, is there any other method to identify? This is a question from Manoj Tatham. Uh, diastereo protons? Diastereo protons, apart from yeah. the coupling constant, is there yeah, any other to, method? Uh, no, we can... Uh, we can also uh, analyze, analyze uh, I mean, identify them by chemical methods. As I told you, um, chemical method for diastereotopic protons is you just uh, replace one hydrogen. Of course, that would be a little more uh, here. So you have one chiral center already. That means these two protons are diastereotopic. That's what I said. So you replace one uh, hydrogen with uh, another substituent, you will get one diastereomer. And replace the other hydrogen, of course, chemically it will be an elaborate process, by another substituent. So you will, by the same substituent, you will have a second diastereomer. So if you can uh, substitute at this position, a prochiral center, so you will get two diastereomers. That will confirm that these are diastereotopic. Otherwise, uh, in proton NMR, they will have different chemical shapes. That is sufficient. And it's a geminal coupling. Geminal coupling will be uh, quite high normally, 18, you know, up to 18 hertz. That is another uh, useful information to you know, assign the diastereotopic proton. Basically, you can convert them to diastereomers. So you will get two different compounds. Okay. Yes. Another question uh, from uh, Angel and Joy. Is proton in bromoform shielded compared to proton attached to nitro group? Why is it so? Bromine is also electronegative. So. Yeah, but the electronegativity of bromine is not that uh, you know, compared to chlorine or fluorine. We have seen the electronegativity of bromine, how much uh, it is uh, for two points. <laughs> And the other thing is the electron cloud around bromine is spatially disposed. It's a huge, big atom, right? And that, uh, it's a, I think it's called heavy atom effect that shields the uh, adjacent proton, uh, you know, substantially. So, and if you have iodine, it would be even worse. The chemical shift would be, I mean, the proton will be much uh, shielded. So it is the heavy atom effect, and because of the uh, six, I mean, three pairs of electrons around each bromine, that will uh, heavily shield the, the nucleus, a proton. And that is why the chemical shift in uh, bromoform derivative of that proton attached to bromoform was very uh, very So overall shielding. And that decreases when you go to uh, more electronegative and smaller, uh, you know, halogens.
So uh, next question. In the anxiety drug you have shown, the yeah. methylene group, uh, if uh, is is there is any chance to behave like an enantiotopic proton? Uh, it is not a chiral compound. Uh, let me see. Alpidin, right? Yeah, uh, this one. Right. Which uh, methylene? It is NCS2. Uh, uh, I mean, NCS2 or this? Uh, we have CCS2 also and two NCS2s. Yeah, that is not mentioned, in fact. Uh, probably she will. OK. Um, yeah, the I can answer that still. Uh, the question is whether uh, that will behave uh, an ensure topic. That yeah. means if you replace one hydrogen with uh, another substituent, we will get one enantiomer. If you replace the other hydrogen, you get another then an enantiomer. Yeah, that is that's possible. Those are an ensure topic. Okay. So I have a question on the on the curcumin uh, 13C which you have shown. Yeah. Uh, the aromatic region. Yeah. Uh, there are only two quaternary carbons, but there should be three. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm, see so from um, that aromatic, uh, there should be three because they all, the two OME attached carbons are different, right? Two OME attached carbons are here, these two. Yeah, those, those are different and then the other one. So it should, uh, in principle, it should give three. But I think uh, you have shown three, you said two. Uh, because no, this, size is not wrong. this is another carbon. This is another carbon, and this because from this the side, size. I, I can from the height of the, one minute. From the I'll height of the carbon, I'll use the pointer. This is another carbon, yeah. and that could be either this or I, either this. It could be even okay. this. That is there. Okay. I just that because it is ortho to one methoxy and para to other methoxy, and it's a small signal. So this is most probably that particular carbon. Okay, and the other or two are coming together? It should, could be, it should should be right. Sorry? The other two are the, 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 no, the carbon these, which are attached to the, yeah. Or these two. Yeah. Those two are here, this. That, that's quite intense. Those two carbons are here, oh. around oh. one. These are quaternary carbons, of course. Um, I'm telling from our experience, but we can confirm it by uh, APT or DEPT. These are quaternary carbons. Oh. They're in oh. high. And because COME will come here, aromatic carbon to which a methoxy attached will come here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Intensity is okay. high. Yeah. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Okay. There is one question. In what always a proton can get shielded or de-shielded? Angelin Joy is a question from Angelin Joy. In what? Always a proton can get shielded or de-shielded. Oh, what are the ways? A different ways. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are the ways by which a proton? Yeah, so as we have discussed, um, if uh, there are electronegative atoms attached uh, to, uh, if there are electronegative atoms in the vicinity, then uh, de-shielding could take place. If there are electron-rich atoms or groups in the vicinity, shielding could take place. Uh, similarly, the orientation of the uh, molecule of the matters, as we have seen in the case of acetylene, Ethylene aromatic ring system uh, with respect to the applied field. Uh, so, all these uh, will matter. So, an ion support uh, effect. Uh, if, it, if a proton is on the side of an electron rich substituent, it could be shielded, otherwise, de shielded, as we have seen in the case of NN dimethyl acetamide. So, all these factors affect uh, chemical shift. Overall, we can say in one word the environment electronegative atoms 
orientation of the nuclear, uh, whether there are, uh, you know, hydrogen, whether there is hydrogen bonding possible, and uh, you know, uh, the resonance, photomerism, those also affect the chemical shape. We have seen a proton coming at 16 ppm because uh, in the enolic form. Uh, enolic form, there's a there is hydrogen bonding possible, and that moreover it is an OH proton. So OH proton, because of the electronegativity of oxygen, and also hydrogen bonding with another electronegative atom makes it highly destabilized. In fact, sometimes proton can go up to 35, 40 even 50, if you have uh, uh, shift reagents. Some of uh, the students might have studied lanthanide shift reagents. So if you use shift reagents, some of the protons can go up to 40 or 50. Okay. Because we, you, you can use, uh, you know, um, those are metal complexes. So the metals can either shield or de-shield, depending upon the, uh, on that. Uh, you know, very good separation of signals is possible using shift reagents. So one can uh, play with uh, different reagents as well in order to change the chemical shifts. In addition to the, uh, in the group or atoms present already in the molecule, one can also use external reagents to change the chemical shift, get better resolution and so on. There is one question from Dr. Annie Deepthi. Uh, yeah. Can you explain the 13C of the aromatic region of isoparbifuran? Okay, I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, the aromatic region has six. How many? Six benzo carbons, two furan carbons, eight plus four phenyl carbons. So 14. 14 uh, phenyl will have only four because of the symmetry. And we see one, two, uh, three, 13, I think. One, we have counted earlier one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So six plus two, eight, plus, no, 12 only. 12 are expected. Six, two, and four. And we see 11, 11. And uh, how many um, uh, point carbons? So phenyl group, groups will have three, that is ortho, meta, para, and these two, two. So three plus two, five methane carbons. And you have one, two, three, and this is for two, five. All the other are quaternary carbons. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven quaternary carbons. And I can count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and that of phenyl, seven. So all can be accounted for. Now, if you want to further distinguish, I mean, we can also, based on relative electron density, we can uh, try to predict uh, which carbon is which, which is also possible. Or one can also compare with the, uh, you know, what the software predicts. For example, these two methane carbons are certainly for these two. These. The electron rich carbon. And this is for the aromatic, the phenyl, and so on. And the most uh, uh, de-shielded ones, uh, you have two here and one this and one this, four. So there are four carbons with uh, uh, oxygen attack. I will assign these four for that. So that way, what we should do is uh, we should uh, assign the easier ones. That is how we logically build up the assignment so that, uh, and then look for uh, consistency, internal consist consistency. Leave the tough one to, to the end. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So I was under the impression that when the oxygen atom is attached to the aromatic ring, 
there yeah. is some uh, electro donating effect always right sir so i was under the impression that yeah. those carbons will be somewhat more shielded so electron donating effect will be left uh, felt by the ortho carbons only not the ipso okay. carbons okay ipso okay carbons experience uh, deshielding effect these okay. two come in the 140 to 160 range even 165 these okay two, this all will come uh, here in this 140 to 150 range whereas ortho carbon will come here yeah so okay sir thank you sir thank you two competing effects electronegativity and the mesomeric effect so electronegativity will be felt by the ipso carbon whereas mesomeric effect plus m effect will be left by uh, felt by the uh, ortho carbons so okay okay sir thank you thank you very much yeah thank you there any other uh... I, anil we can uh, come to the conclusion right let's no more question i guess yeah. if you would like to see uh, a list of books i will try to share i have uh, the updated list uh, of books for nmr so here it is I will close this right. Are you able to see this word for this word file? So yeah, yeah. yeah, yes. One. Little bit magnify a little bit. Yeah, I'll try to the bottom. Zoom it. No, the bottom you can scroll, you know. Yeah. Uh, so Lambert, uh, Granite, Shovel, Leitner. The organic structural spectroscopy peer. This is a good book. William Kemp, certainly. I think the third edition is there, appeared in 2019. And then uh, Williams and Fleming, a good book. Again, the recent seventh edition appeared in 2019. And then Silverstein Basler, I have already, already told you, I think the latest edition is 2005. I'm not sure whether any new edition has been published, but it's a very good book. It has a lot of uh, problems uh, and solutions as well. Avia is another book, Introduction to Spectroscopy. Uh, fifth edition has come in 2015. And then uh, you know, LED is not relevant to the NMR, it is for ORDCD. Uh, and also many general organic chemistry books will have a lot of information on uh, NMR, as uh, Sanil Kumar said, Morgan and Boyd. Uh, even Boyd has a lot of you know, practical organic chemistry books. And can we can go? Sure. Yeah, sure. So I think we can conclude at this point. Uh, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Nambudri for giving a very clear uh, presentation on the on different aspects of proton and 13 C NMR, actually solving small molecules and giving a number of uh, thank you very much sir thank you thank you very much and share the slides uh, provided uh, students don't yeah, yeah you, you can send me the slides yeah so i can uh, send them yeah. yeah they can use it thank for you their so much, purpose no. but they are advised not to upload it on internet anywhere that's all mm -hmm. yeah. but is it problem that we actually in this in this, in this, in this Program is live streamed. Yeah. Oh, this is like yeah. It is already there. That is okay. No problem. Okay. It's on. Uh, but we, we actually uploaded the YouTube. It's actually recorded and uploaded the YouTube. Okay. That, is, that is fine. I mean, there is okay. no classified information, but uh, still. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah.
on public network i suggest them not to upload okay thank you so much doc okay. thank you thank you very much for having me again Yeah, we will see you sometime. Okay. Yeah. I'm very well initiated. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye then. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Okay.